A Câmara dos Deputados acaba de decidir que o processo de impeachment da presidente Dilma Rousseff Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the media developments we're covering this week. What's driving the story in Brazil? Is it corruption or is it the media there? An editor and a blogger killed in Bangladesh. Another blogger says he's facing death threats. From social media to mobile messaging, how news, rumors, and government propaganda are now coming straight to your phone. And all the cliches of the campaign trail, the political ad deconstructed. Audiences around the world have seen the images from the streets of Brazil. Millions of demonstrators for and against the president in dozens of cities in the biggest political protests in the country's history. But what is the real story? Is it really about corruption and the rampant money laundering of those involved in the Petrobras scandal? Because if it is, then how is the main opposition party, many of whose own members have been implicated, in a position to impeach President Dilma Rousseff? Or is this the story of an out-and-out -out political power struggle? And how much of it is being driven by Brazilian media barons who are conservative and whose ideological hostility to Rousseff's workers' party, the PT, is no secret? Brazil's most influential broadcast and print outlets like Globo, Abril and Folia are media powerhouses owned by a handful of the country's richest families. Those outlets have been called out for their selective and strategic coverage of this impeachment story. And they've been accused of trying to use the corruption scandal to unseat a government that 50 million Brazilians voted for less than two years ago. In an attempt to change the narrative, President Rousseff held a private media briefing with journalists from major international outlets, letting them know that there's more to this story and its coverage than meets the eye. But with Parliament already having voted to impeach her and the bulk of domestic media coverage still working against her, the president has a huge mountain to climb. Our starting point this week is the capital, Brasilia. Beginning with what this story is not. It is not, as some defenders of the Rousseff government argue, a mere media conspiracy. Right-wing oligarchs trying to bring down a leftist government. The Petrobras scandal is on a scale unlike anything Brazil has ever seen. $1.7 billion worth of bribes paid that we know about. 179 people charged, 93 convictions, adding up to sentences totaling nearly 1,000 years of jail time. The Petrobras story, combined with a tanking economy and further allegations against President Rousseff over cooking the budgetary books before her re-election in 2014, all created a cumulative effect leading to the lower house of parliament voting to impeach her. There's huge discontent in Brazil. The, the idea that it's the people are coming in the, in the streets to protest just because the media is telling them to do so and this is all fabricated, this is neither true. There are factual reasons why people are discontent in Brazil. The unemployment is very high. The inflation is very high. Yes, there is a conspiracy, but there is basis for that conspiracy. We're living through the biggest political crisis of the last 25 years, a complex and deep investigation with lots of breaking news about big companies and important political characters, as well as a strong economic depression. It has culminated in the impeachment process that was approved in Congress and is now waiting to be approved by the Senate. That impeachment vote, which took place two weeks ago, was a marathon piece of political theatre broadcast on screens big and small across the country. More than 150 elected deputies have been implicated in the Petrobras scandal, and most of them voted to impeach a president who hasn't been implicated. And they performed for the cameras that they knew were watching many dedicating their yes votes to figures and causes that would resonate with Brazilians. The entire process lasted more than eight hours and some Brazilian broadcasters covered it live in its entirety. Most of the mainstream media, as you know, is pro-impeachment. So that gives you a clear idea where they're coming from. So having eight hours of a spectacle 
is the best that they can get. It is a frightening discourse that was there. The media is a very important social actor in Brazil, there is no doubt, and especially in crisis time. In Brazil, you have a mainstream media that uh, tends to the right of the political spectrum. The first big protest in March of last year, O Globo newspaper, its cover said, Brazil has a new 15th of March. The last famous 15th of March was in 1985, the day the military regime handed power back to civilian leaders. So they're framing a pro-impeachment march as somehow equivalent to the end of 21 years of dictatorship. That, that reveals clear political bias. Accusations of media bias in Brazil inevitably start with Globo, the biggest media conglomerate in Latin America. In 2014, The Economist called Globo Brazil's most powerful company, and it wasn't just talking about the media sector. Globo owns, or is affiliated with, 340 media outlets, 122 of them television channels, the rest in print, radio, or online. Its nightly national newscast, Jornal Nacional, is watched by more than 90 million people. No other broadcast comes close in ratings or influence. And Globo has a history of conservative politics trumping its journalism, notably its support of Brazil's military dictatorship between 1964 and 1985. In 2013, almost three decades after democracy was restored, Globo finally issued an apology for failing its audiences during that period. E há também o reconhecimento de erros, como o apoio editorial ao golpe militar de 1964. Reporters Without Borders ranks countries annually on freedom of the press. In 2010, it had Brazil at 58th. This year, it is down to 104th. The NGO cited concentrated ownership in the hands of a few leading families. And on this story said the media have urged the public to bring down the president. Globo is owned by the Mourinho family, which defended the company in the pages of the UK's Guardian newspaper. The Brazilian press and the Globo Group fulfilled their duty to inform about everything, wrote João Mourinho, as would have been the case in any other democracy. But when Globo's news outlets or other news organizations in Brazil report on politics, many are suspicious of the journalism and mindful of the history. Nowadays, because you don't have this shrewd uh, military coup, you have this traditional institutional mechanism to get rid of the opponent. And in that process, you have to legitimize it. And that is what the Brazilian media is doing, is legitimizing what we have to call it by its name, is a coup in slow motion. I understand that the Workers' Party needs a narrative, and the only way that they have found they can survive is by creating a narrative, that they are the victims of a political coup, and that the press has played a part in this. But the fact remains that the impeachment process is following constitutional requirements. So to talk about a coup does not make sense. A coup implies that the rules have been broken, and this is not the case. On the last piece that you, uh, was produced by Al Jazeera for, about Brazil, there was a Globe uh, reporter, and, and his last phrase was, we are balanced, our news are balanced. I kind of stopped the, the video there and I said, how on earth can you say this to a public communication media? You're not being ethical. Between uh, the argument that Global and these other news organizations are just coldly, neutrally reporting on the facts, on the one hand, uh, which is clearly not true, and that they are in league to overthrow the government, on the other hand, is an enormous distance. And, and the truth is in the middle of that. 
There are some Brazilian news outlets that bring something different to the table. Media Ninja is a collective of citizen journalists that got its start in 2013 during the first wave of protests against Rousseff's government. It now has more than 630,000 followers on Facebook and publishes in seven languages. The name Ninja is a Portuguese language acronym for independent narratives, journalism, and action. Agencia Pública is a non-profit investigative journalism organization based in Sao Paulo whose reporting is often republished by other outlets, including Al Jazeera. It belongs to the public and its stories often look at the defense of human rights or violence by agents of the state. Publica practices transparency. Its website includes details on how it's funded and who its partners are. Then there's Fluxu, created in 2014 by Bruno Tortura, who prior to that had set up Media Ninja. Operating mostly from Sao Paulo, Fluxu is about long-form reportage, whether it's video, audio, or text. It relies on its audience for news stories as well as its funding. Other media stories that are on our radar this week, these are dangerous times for journalists and bloggers in Bangladesh. Two men have been killed there, presumably for their writings, by extremist groups intolerant of secular thinking. On April 25th, Julhaz Manan and a friend were both found dead in the capital, Dhaka. Manan was a gay rights activist, the editor of the country's first gay magazine. The two men were killed by unknown assailants, hacked to death with machetes. Two days before that, Rezaul Karim Sadiqi, an English language professor, secular blogger and political activist, was killed in the northwestern city of Raj Shahi. The government is saying that it suspects the banned Ansarullah Bangla team was behind that attack. Back in 2013, the Ansarullah team issued a hit list on the country's bloggers and activists. In the two years since, at least 10 journalists or bloggers have been murdered in the country. Another well-known blogger, Imran Sarkar, has reported that he too has been the subject of anonymous death threats. Sarkar has led a campaign against the killings of secularist bloggers, and he is a staunch critic of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government and its failure to protect Bangladeshi journalists. Dozens of journalists were detained in Cairo this past Monday as security forces there try to keep a lid on dissent. The reporters were covering protests against the LCC government's decision to transfer the ownership of two Egyptian islands in the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia, which has recently pumped billions of dollars into the Egyptian economy. There was a heavy security presence in the capital, preventing all but small demonstrations from taking place, and at least 33 journalists were taken into custody. Protesters were barred by police from demonstrating in front of the press syndicate building in Cairo. However, supporters of President el-Sisi, who had organized a counter-demonstration, were allowed to gather there. Sharif Mansour from the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists said, Egyptian authorities appear determined to prevent any protests. Rather than repeating its predecessor's mistake of trying to silence dissent, the government should ensure reporters can do their job safely and without fear of reprisal. Before the Panama Papers, there were the Luxembourg leaks, and three men involved in that story, two whistleblowers and a French journalist, are now facing trial. The so-called Lux leaks happened in November of 2014. They exposed tax avoidance schemes worth billions of dollars involving more than 300 international companies, including Amazon, Ikea, and Dyson. The whistleblowers Antoine Del Tour and Raphael Allais worked for the accounting firm Price Waterhouse Coopers. They are accused of theft, secrecy violation, and wrongfully accessing a database. Edouard Perrin, a journalist from France, too, is accused of complicity in the case. The trial is expected to last until May 4th. If you're getting your news mainly on Facebook and Twitter and then sharing it, statistically speaking, you are now in the minority. Mobile messaging apps like WhatsApp, Line and Viber have overtaken web-based social media when it comes to user numbers. However, sending messages is just a small part of the global story. In countries like China and South Korea, people are using apps like WeChat and Kakao Talk to get online, do their shopping, pay their bills, gaming, booking flights and hotels, as well as finding and sharing the news. All the major news outlets in China have accounts on WeChat, some with followers numbering in the tens of millions. However, officially sanctioned news providers work in the same space as amateurs do. And false news and rumor mongering have opened a path 
to some state censorship. In South Korea, Kakao Talk has been pressured to hand over user data after criticism of the government in Seoul went viral. Things are different in Iran, where Telegram still provides a free forum for news and voices that are banned elsewhere on the Internet. And that had implications during the elections there earlier this year. The Listening Post's Will Young now on three mobile messaging apps and what messaging means for the news business. China has never allowed Silicon Valley's social media giants even a foothold within its borders. So instead of Facebook, Chinese internet users put their profiles up on Renren. China's answer to Twitter, Sina Weibo. But with 1.1 billion accounts, China's version of WhatsApp dwarfs them all. WeChat, or Weixin as it's known in China, is much more than just a messaging app. It's a one-stop portal for just about everything on the web. Gaming, shopping, accessing government services, and after a government clampdown on Weibo, WeChat is now China's number one online platform for sharing the news. Chinese internet has been, had an incredibly vibrant internet culture, but there was unfortunately a large crackdown on uh, Weibo uh, in the summer of 2013. In essence, these sorts of vibrant conversations were being stifled, and a lot of the really interesting conversations shifted towards WeChat. One of the biggest problems that traditional newspapers have is that they are missing out on young audiences. Whether it's the current newspaper subscribers or potential subscribers in the future, a lot of new users on WeChat are young people. WeChat has become an essential platform to publish news. Global Times reaches audiences and delivers news by setting up its own public WeChat account. This is a platform for us to publish news and other content. Global Times is a state-owned English language newspaper with four million followers on WeChat. Its sister paper, the Mandarin language People's Daily, has more than 45 million followers. CCTV, China's state broadcaster, has 42 million. But even the biggest players share WeChat's information space with what's come to be known as We Media. Channels run by individuals reporting and aggregating the news for hundreds, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of followers. The trouble is, not everything that gets shared on WeChat is actually true. For example, at the time of the 2015 Tianjin explosion, there was a rumor regarding a cyanide leak which was started by a journalist on the scene. It was confirmed to be fake news, but it spread very quickly on WeChat and it caused a lot of fear and disorder. Another example is the 2016 vaccine scandal, when an old story about poisonous vaccines spread on WeChat. The report was very unprofessional and included a lot of misinformation. Certainly, you can make the very credible case that false news should be censored or should be prevented from spreading. But you also have these very new, um, more recent, uh, strict regulations that are outlined in these very vague terms. And so it could be used as a tool by authorities to essentially curtail types of speech that they don't want. Across the Yellow Sea to South Korea and Kakao Talk, much like WeChat in China, hosts games, commerce, social sharing, news outlets, and at its peak, the app boasted monthly users of more than three quarters of South Korea's population. But in 2014, a ferry disaster sparked online rumors that brought President Park Gwen hye some unwanted attention. The government targeted the app, and users reacted. 2014 was the beginnings of the government asking for Kakao Talk to hand over certain conversations. The government felt was people spreading rumors. Kakao immediately actually refused to give more information to the government because for a period of time, people started flocking to Telegram, which is a more end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. When they realized that a lot of folks were shifting over to Telegram, they essentially said to the government, look, you're going to destroy our service if you continue to require us to follow these onerous measures of yours. So they basically entered a year-long standoff. In March, South Korea passed anti-terror laws that force Kakao to hand over private data when the government demands it. But in Iran, the situation is different. 
Telegram, which has an estimated 20 million users in the country, is still available, unrestricted, despite carrying content that would be banned on other platforms. Unlike WeChat in China and Kakao Talk in South Korea, Telegram is headquartered in Berlin, which means that exercising control from Tehran may not be that easy. And in any case, even government figures who are hostile to a free internet are already using Telegram to reach their audiences. Central authority is very crucial to how the internet operates inside of Iran since 2009, following the Green Movement. But Telegram is an outlier in this whole process. There is no authority really keeping track of what kind of content can make it out on Telegram channels. You have accounts belonging to BBC journalists whose articles and whose content would usually be filtered inside of Iran, but they have a lot of followers on their Telegram channels. The government has come out a number of times and made statements about how Telegram is proving to be a threat, but it's also a platform for the Iranian government to also have its own narrative pushed out to uh, Iranian users on a mass scale. There are certain elements of Telegram specifically that are a little bit less threatening to the government than other messaging apps. There are uh, sort of broadcast channels that news organizations or individuals can use, but they don't allow people to comment or to share those posts. So there's a little less public conversation, a little bit less virality, uh, you know, sort of built into it. Despite these limitations, Telegram made a mark on Iran's elections earlier this year. Reformist activists and citizen media used it to spread information on candidates and campaign messages that could not have reached audiences through traditional media. Former President Khatami, who is widely popular, has been put under a media ban. His name cannot be present in the official media. At a uh, reformist election rally, they played a video message of him urging voters to vote for the most reformist candidate. Now, this recording was not mentioned in official media in any capacity, but it went viral on social media, especially on Telegram. When you look at WeChat uh, in China and Kakao Talk in South Korea, most of their audience is really in one country, and that means that if they rub the government the wrong way uh, in that one country, then their business is seriously at risk. Telegram can take a hit if, if it happens in one country and still be okay. For now, Telegram's owners in Berlin remain out of reach from Tehran. So Telegram is still an uncensored island in a sea of online restrictions. Telegram is not yet for Iran what WeChat is for China or Kakao Talk is for South Korea, but in a world where apps are challenging social media for supremacy, it may not be long before even more countries get the message. Finally, we resisted the temptation this week to do another piece on the coverage of the U.S. presidential elections. Instead, we decided to go with this fictional video that speaks truth about power and some of the techniques used by those trying to get into power. Candidates on the campaign trail try to tap into our emotions through words as well as the power of imagery. There's a stock video footage company in Calgary called Dissolve. Even though it's based in Canada, Dissolve has a pretty good feel for the American dream and the kinds of images and cliches that candidates resort to in order to push our buttons and get our votes. This is Dissolve's generic presidential campaign ad. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post. Hello, it's me, candidate for president. Wherever I go, so do lens flares and fields in sunlight. Here are a bunch of different people matched with career signifiers, like a helmet, a uniform, or a stethoscope. But I'm not racist. Here's a Hispanic family who doesn't mind being associated with me. The economy, faith, and education are all things I've addressed in non-specific ways. But I'll put these particular words right on the screen because they always get applause. Great, nation, troops, more, less, budget, security, veterans, children, jobs, future, strong. 
see, you can't deny that these people are clapping. I'm a candidate for president, and I endorse this message. Unless you disagree. In which case, I had nothing to do with it.